Hi, my name is Melissa Moore, and I'm from the Howard Hughes Medical Institute and the University of Massachusetts Medical School, and I'm here today to tell you about split genes and RNA splicing. Most of you are familiar with the central dogma of biology, which was elaborated by Sir Francis Crick in 1956. And what the central dogma says is that DNA is copied into uh, or transcribed into RNA and then the, uh, that RNA is translated into a different language and that is the language of proteins. So one of the central tenets of the central dogma of biology is that one gene encodes one protein. And this is very much true in bacteria where if one uh, breaks open a bacterial cell and spreads out the DNA and RNA, you can see very clearly that here is the DNA and as the DNA is being transcribed into RNA, uh, it's being joined by ribosomes. So these black, big black, black blobs here are polyribosomes, and those are making protein. And so the, the RNA is, is copied directly or translated directly into proteins. So here I'm showing a eukaryotic cell next to a prokaryotic cell. So these are bacteria next to a white blood cell. And you can see that uh, the white blood cell is much, much larger than the bacteria. And so not only is our uh, eukaryotic cells larger than bacteria, but they also are more complicated internally. Uh, if th this is the bacterial uh, structure down here, and this would be the eukaryotic internal structure. And you can see that in the eukaryote, the DNA is in the, in the nucleus, whereas the ribosomes are out here in the cytoplasm, as you can particularly see these ones on the rough ER here. And so the uh, big difference for a eukaryotic cell is that the DNA is not directly accessed by the ribosomes. Also, in the eukaryotic cell, this is a gene that is being transcribed from this direction to this direction. And so you can see that the RNA coming off of the DNA is getting longer and longer as it's being transcribed to this direction. But at some point, there are these loops that form. And in fact, these loops uh, are introns that get spliced out. So unlike, uh, eukary unlike prokaryotic genes, eukaryotic genes are split in nature. They have uh, segments of them that need to be spliced out before they can be used to make proteins. So this slide shows the current day view of eukaryotic gene expression. And that is that eukaryotic genes are split, meaning that they contain sequences that are not contained within the final mRNA and which are not translated into protein sequence. Those sequences are called introns, and they are represented by the, the white line here. And the exons are the little colored boxes. Those are the expressed regions. When a gene is turned on and transcribed, it is uh, the entire gene is transcribed first into a pre-messenger RNA or pre-mRNA. And that pre-mRNA undergoes several steps of processing. First, it is capped with a 7-methyl uh, guanosine cap. Um, at, the, at the 3 prime end, it is cleaved and then a poly A tail is added. And then in the middle, these intron sequences are literally spliced out. So there is, a scissors, there is a molecular scissors and tape that does the job of uh, pre-mRNA splicing. After all of the processing is done, the mRNA migrates to the uh, nuclear envelope where it is exported and then used to um, tra be translated into proteins. This is the, shows the structure of the typical human gene. So the typical human gene has uh, 23,000 base pairs and seven introns. Now I'm using the, a median here because if I use the average, it would be very much thrown off by uh, some of the very large genes that we're going to talk about in a little bit. Uh, the other thing that you'll notice is that the typical um, human gene has a median intron length of over 10 times that of the exon lengths. So that means that whenever a human gene is transcribed, 90 to 95 percent of the RNA is immediately uh, spliced out and thrown away. And that seems rather wasteful. So we'll be talking about um, 
why it is that, what, why do we have the, these, these uh, intronic regions? What good are they uh, if we're wasting that much RNA? But before we, we will uh, discuss by looking at the gene number versus complexity problem. So let's consider how many genes different kinds of organisms have. So here, for example, is E. coli, a bacterium, and S. cervicii, budding yeast, or the yeast that is used to make bread um, or uh, brew beer. E. coli is a bacterium in your gut. Now, we've already shown that bacteria are much simple, simpler cells than eukaryotes, so you might expect that E. coli, e. coli not to have as many genes as S. cervicii, and that's true. So uh, E. coli has 30, about 3,200 genes, and S. cervicii has about 6,000 genes. And by genes here, I'm talking about protein coding genes. Uh, now, if we go up the evolutionary ladder, let's consider two other uh, model organisms, C. elegans, or the roundworm, and uh, Dr Drosophila melanogaster, the fruit fly. Now, on the surface, it might seem that Drosophila is the more complicated organism, so it would have more genes than the uh, roundworm, but in fact, it's the opposite way. So C. elegans has about 19,000 genes, and um, Drosophila melanogaster only has about 13,000 genes. So now you have to ask yourself, how much more complicated am I than a fruit fly or a roundworm? So how many genes do we expect humans to have? Or humans, mice, and even the uh, a mustard plant, so something that, that might be a little more complicated than a roundworm. Um, and so if a roundworm has 19,000 genes, uh, before the human genome was sequenced, people were thinking that humans would have around 100,000 genes. The big surprise has come that, in fact, all of these organisms have about the same number of genes, and they're all around 25,000. So it's really not a very big number. And just by this uh, count, you know, we're no more com complicated than twice a fruit fly or uh, about 1.3 times a, a roundworm. That's sort of troubling. So how can we get away with that? Well, the way we get away the, uh, with this lack, this apparent lack of complexity is alternative splicing. So eukaryotes, uh, in addition to uh, having split genes, they um, defy the uh, central dogma of biology, the original central dogma of biology. And that is that uh, we may have one gene, but one gene can make many, many proteins. And so, for example, here is one gene where if all of the exons are spliced in, then it makes one protein. But if the red exon is left out, it makes a different protein. And then here, the blue exon, uh, exon 4, is left out and that makes yet a third protein. So the, on this particular gene, there are three proteins coming from one gene. And we now know from uh, recent deep sequencing efforts that about 95% of all human genes exhibit alternative splicing. So that means that our proteome, the number of proteins that we have, is much, much larger than our genome. Now, there, there are many different kinds of alternative splicing. So um, there can be alternative promoters, which is the beginning of the gene. There can be alternative poly A sites, so that's the three prime end of the gene. Alternative five prime splice sites, we'll talk about what a five prime splice site is in a minute, but it's the beginning of an intron. Alternative three prime splice sites. And then there are exons called cassette exons that are either uh, spliced in or spliced out. That's the example I was showing you a minute ago. And there are mutually exclusive exons where either one exon is put in or the other, but not both. And then, of course, the simplest form of alternative splicing is to not splice at all. So you can splice or not splice, and that would be a retained intron. So there are many different types of alternative splicing. The, the most common type of alternative splicing is the cassette exon, where a, an exon is either spliced in or spliced out. Now, how many different proteins can be made from one gene? So this is the alpha tropomyosin gene from rat. And these are some of the uh, different uh, splice forms of the alpha tropomyosin gene. And so you can see that um, 
there, there are many different uh, splice forms in fibroblasts. Those are essentially uh, undifferentiated cells. Then here's other isoforms in the brain, in the smooth muscle. And so one of the, the important things about splicing is that it can be developmentally and tissue specifically controlled. And so one gene in one tissue might make one protein, but in another tissue it makes a very different protein. Um, and so again, that, that's how we add to complexity. So just how complex can it get? Well, here's the current record holder. So this is the Drosophila D-SCAM gene, which is involved in axonal guidance in the brain. And uh, Drosophila D-SCAM has three regions of uh, mutually exclusive exons. So there's one here, one here, one here, and one there. This region has 48, 33, there's two over there, and there's 12 back here. So if you do the math, there are over 38,000 different possible spliced isoforms of the D-SCAM gene. And to the best of our knowledge, all of these isoforms can be made. So that means that this one gene in Drosophila can make three times as many different proteins as there are genes in the Drosophila genome. So it is very likely that in higher eukaryotes, such as you and me, our proteome is um, a well over hundreds, hundreds of thousands to, to millions of different proteins. So just with that thought in mind, now let's look back at our complexity problem. But this time, instead of looking at genes, let's look at how many introns uh, each organism has and then how that scales with complexity. So in uh, E. coli, it has no introns. Prokaryotes do not have these types of introns. Um, S. cerevisiae our budding yeast, has a few introns. It only has about 250 introns. Now as we go up the, the evolutionary ladder, um, the roundworm has about uh, 99,000 introns, again, more than the, the fruit fly, simply because it has more genes. Uh, but as we go up now to, to humans and, and to mice, you can see that the number of introns are, are going up dramatically. And because um, the number of proteins that you can make scales, so let's say, exponentially with, uh, with the number of introns, you can imagine that our proteomes can be much more complicated than those of the other organisms. Now we want to talk about, I want to uh, tell you about a particularly gargantuan uh, gene, and that is the dystrophin gene. So dystrophin uh, encodes a, a protein that's necessary for your muscles, and uh, mutations in this gene are one of the causes of muscular dystrophy. The DMD gene is the second largest gene in the human genome. It's 2.2 million base pairs long. It has 79 exons, 78 introns, and one of those introns is 400,000 nucleotides long. Now, it's really hard for, for you, um, with just me saying this, to, to really get a sense of the scale of this thing. So, Next, I'm going to show you a little movie so that you can really see just how big this gene is. Here we are with our scale model of the dystrophin gene that is uh, represented by this rope. And I want you to look at the end of this rope. So the little um, colored uh, tape marks here are the exons, and the white uh, rope is the intron. And you can see that here's the next exon, so the, the introns are much, much longer than the exons. Now, to just to give you a sense of how big this gene is, I'm going to pretend that I am RNA polymerase, and I trans start transcribing this gene when you get up in the morning. So this is uh, the t your time point of breakfast here. So here I go, here's RNA polymerase. I'm transcribing this gene. It's not even still morning. Here's our mid-morning snack. So we're still going. Polymerase incredibly processive on this gene. We haven't even gone a million base pairs yet. Now we're about halfway through the gene. So we're, this is, uh, it's lunchtime. So the polymerase is still transcribing this gene. We're still going, still going. Here we are at mid-afternoon. We're getting into to dinner time now and we've been going for about 13 or 14 hours now. 
finally, when you're about ready to go to bed, after 16 hours, we get to the very end of the gene, the last exon. It took 16 hours for polymerase to transcribe this entire gene uh, of dystrophin. All right, so you've just seen how long dystrophin RNA is. And I can tell you that that was a 99.4 foot rope. Now once all of those introns are removed to scale, this is the size of the messenger RNA. This messenger RNA is very long. It, it is a 17,000 base messenger RNA. But it is less than 1% of the original RNA that was transcribed. You know, really pretty amazing.